Hello coders and welcome to another How to Code Well podcast. Today we're going to be talking about speaking at web development conferences and we're going to be talking about how that can benefit your web development career. I have the pleasure of being joined by Matt Brunt. Hi Matt, how's it going? Have you had a good week? Hi, uh, it's been a really good week actually. Yeah, we're ahead of the work we're doing. Um, it's really productive. It's, oh, that's it's nice. Yeah, it's good. It's always good when you're ahead of the work. That's really, really yeah. Good. It's 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 a strange feeling, <laughs> um, but it's nice. It's been nice. We've um, we've really na- like nailed it and knocked it out of the park recently. So it's been. Uh, it's nice to see the fruits of fruits of the work sort of coming yeah. together. So, yeah. So so okay. Before we start, then what 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 is the work that you're doing? So we're, I work for a cybersecurity company, um, and the team that I'm a part of, we're building a new uh, events and training platform Ooh. for capture the flag type uh, systems. Right. Um, so it's it's just a, a whole platform to allow uh, people to compete at events um, mm. over, you know, first one to capture the flag uh, wins, really. It's a new system. It's, it's an existing system that is uh, already in place, right. but it wasn't too flexible, you know, the, the joys of legacy, as it were. Yeah. Um, so we're building a new uh, a new platform that's just going to allow them to kind of take it to the next step, really. Um, cool. So we have a team that we've put together um, to build this platform. Um, so we're, we've not finished it yet. It's because it is uh, a, new, a new platform. But right. It's one of those that, you know, in the next couple of months, it's going to be out there and ready. Oh, um, nice. It's nice. nice from a technical aspect because there's a lot of new challenges with it. And mm-hmm. also the sort of you have to consider in what ways the system's going to be poked and prodded because, you know, the demographic are people that are looking to break things. Um, right. Well, yeah. yeah, I guess if they're capturing the fact. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, is this is you say this is for security, right? So is, yeah. th- is this kind of like um, uh, here's a system and try and break it. And then the other team is to t- try and defend that system is that all right uh not directly no it's generally going to be more of what's called the red team stuff which is the attacking side uh, of things okay. um, so okay. it's more about um <clears throat> the events will post a challenge set of challenges right each of those challenges will have a, a vulnerable system somewhere attached to it right um and the idea is that you know it's in somewhere in this system given the challenge briefing um there is a flag to be captured it could be you need to escalate privileges or you know uh go through um some uh file decryption or something right um and then you know once you've entered the flag you you gain the points for that challenge and you can move on to the next one oh wow. Um, wow. some of them are sort of knockout events so mm-hmm. once one team has scored it the other teams can't so it's you know first first to get the flag wins kind of thing yeah um other ones are it's you've got a limited time period and the ones who get the most points over the whole event will be the ones who uh who, who win the, the the event and uh you know for beating all the others to the, yeah. the, the finish line. Oh, that were. sounds super cool. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Can you, can you, um, I mean, I would love to talk about that until the cows <laughs> come home, uh, but can you talk about like how you got to that point? How did you start web development? Um, what was the thing that inspired you to do, to get into the, the wonderful world that is coding? Yeah. Um, I kind of, I don't have a background. Like I see a lot of people, programmers especially talking about how you know they've been programming since they were four years old and their you know their, their their parents had a computer and they were tinkering it and breaking it before you know before they went mm. to school type thing um i didn't actually touch a computer until i was about 13 right um and i didn't really even get into get into programming until i was maybe 16 or so mm-hmm. um i was involved in a lot of computer forums i was really big into computer hardware back then um and through that you know through the, the forums where someone needs a signature making because this was you know um 90s 2000s kind of period uh, mm. where you know forum signatures were, were all the rage um <laughs> i got into a bit of graphic design um and really quite enjoyed that and then progressed from that into actually this you know this can be used to make websites so i used to do a lot of work with um slicing up layouts and converting them into html and css all um, oh, right yeah and then i realized that it was incredibly frustrating having a bunch of html files and having to update the menu in all of them when something needed to change <laughs> uh, so i i discovered primarily php back then because it was you know uh server costs were very minimal you could pick up a reseller account on a cpanel server for a few quid a month type of thing um i got into that and then i learned that you could include files and you wouldn't have to update it everywhere right right excuse me um and that was kind of the magic then i realized that there was this whole new world that was available to me yeah so I did that from kind of 16 or so, uh, and then I went to university at 18 um, okay. to study internet computing, which is a branch of computer science. Right. Um, I did that for four years, and that included two years at university. Then I went away for a year and worked at a, an, a local web development agency. Oh, that's cool. Um, and then went back and did my final year, right. which was 
a blessing and a curse. It was a blessing because once I eventually graduated, no one asked about my degree. All they cared about was the fact that I had a year in industry ah. because it was a very clear thing that how it worked in the real world and how academia was teaching it were two very different things. The Venn diagram overlap was very small in that regard. Yeah. Um, so I didn't actually, uh, I got the, I had interviews lined up before I'd finished my exams mm -hmm. and then I started my first web development job the Monday after I finished my last <laughs> my, my exams the week before. Awesome. Um, and none of none, no one in the, in the, any of the interviews I had asked me what degree I was expected to get. Um, <clears throat> which was kind of a good job because my first two years I did really well at uni, mm -hmm. went to work for a year. Um, I came back to work for, I came back to university after working for a year mm -hmm. and kind of sat down in my classes and was very disillusioned about how it all works because you realize that you're being taught things that just aren't relevant anymore or just, it doesn't work like that. And it was, you was, know, the, the, the kind of the motivation to, to, to yeah. get, I, I got my degree, but the motivation was really, really hard because it just, it didn't feel like it was legitimate in the way that you know, everyone else was saying this is how it works in the real world and academia saying here's how it works in our world and they didn't really align too well okay so i uh, just want to pull that apart a little bit so you 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 went to university which university was that uh de montfort in leicester oh nice nice um and that had a combination of of academia and then you were, had the ability to go off and and uh get a work placement was that work placement was that um sort of like pre-arranged pre-agreed how did that happen so um the degree i actually sort of signed up for if you like um mm. it was known as a sandwich degree right so as part of the qualification of that degree i had to go away and work for a year and have a couple of assessments through the year by a tutor coming visiting me on site speaking to my employer and making sure that i was you know up to scratch standard and doing the work and working actively towards I see. Um, towards that, had I not done that placement degree, my degree would have been reclassified and I wouldn't have got an internet computing degree. I would have just got a generic computer studies degree, which is what the universities did at the time, I think. Right, right. Um, so it was a part of my um, my degree was that I had a year in industry as part of this 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 course. Sure. The um, Getting the job wasn't prearranged. That was, you know, in the second year of university, we had to start going out and interviewing at companies for the upcoming year. Um, so we had to go and interview at companies for these placements. Um that had been vetted by the university and made sure that they were up to scratch. Mm -hmm. um, the company that I ended up working for, that I went to work for for that year, mm -hmm. the guy who ran the company was actually a previous student of DeMoffitt University. And since he'd graduated, he'd taken placement students on every single year. Right. And um, because he believed in, in educating and bringing up, you know, a new generation of developers. And he was sure. very passionate about that, which was really great because yeah. the placement student that was there before me then went to work there, after I finished university, I carried on working there in my final year part time, which was great because it gave me a yeah. job to do part time as well. And what I liked doing as well gave me a bit more experience. Um, so it was really nice to, to have the opportunity to go and sort of see the, the world a little bit, yeah. even though it was you know, just down the road at, at another, and another place in Leicester. Yeah. And, and um, also, you, you had the opportunity of doing the interviews, right? So, yeah, that was a big part of it. Yeah. That, was, that was huge. Yeah. Because I, I remember when I came out of uni, it was like, what is this interview thing that you speak of? <laughs> yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it gives you a lot of confidence to be able to be like, oh, I've got this one. I can, I can get another one. Um, yeah, yeah. It was, it was a pretty big deal. Yeah. And am I right in thinking then that the la the final year you went back to the university? Yes. And that's why you felt that that that, that you had two views of the different worlds and they weren't aligned. I see. Very much so. Yeah. yeah. It was the, the yeah you, the two years at university to kind of prepare you and get you all up to standard. Uh -huh. um, year in industry to go away and work and then a year back in academia to sort of hone those skills and polish them off and finish off your degree. Sure. Um, and it was exactly that. Yeah. Going back to university after working for a year yeah. very much felt like this is not how it works out there in the real world. Um, <laughs> and a lot of people felt the same way. It happened to, to a lot of people on, on the, the various courses that did that. Um, they all found that it was, you know, the, the motivation was really hard because yeah. It just, you sort of sit in there learning things. You're like, they're, 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 some of them have been very relevant, but for the large part of it, they just didn't seem practically appropriate to what was actually going on out there in the, in uh -huh. the world of work that we wanted to go into. Yeah, no, I totally dig that. I totally dig that. The, um, yeah, I, I, I have experience with like, uh, being told stuff at uni and then finding out that that isn't the same thing. I mean, I think when I was there, it was like, you know, they were, they were uh, saying that XML was the best thing in the world. And it was like, you know, having to learn what Jason was as soon as you came out, <laughs> it was yeah. all of that kind of stuff. Um, I'm, I'm glad I was taught um, XSLT in university because I did use that a lot. My previous job, I worked with a lot of finance companies who <laughs> do 
do love XML. Okay, cool. Um, so having to work with those that come back quite a lot was that that was the one piece of information that I really like stuck with me from university. And I'm glad it did. Um, <laughs> but I had the same thing. It was um, XML, JESP, Java Server Pages, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, XSQL, and XSLT. That was like a whole module in itself, and that was the future of the web. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> We had a, we had assignments to do in it, and I'm sat there going, "If you give me this in PHP, I can do it in a weekend." Yeah, but it's going to take me, you know, two weeks to do in this other technology that doesn't. It just doesn't feel relevant. No, um, no. and it's still out there. It still works, but it just when there's, you know, I could see that the direction I wanted to go in was slightly different. It just felt well. Um, that that's that's an interesting topic in itself because what you just said there, it's not, you know, it's not relevant. We we you know we write code um, using the tools that fit the project, you know, the purpose of the project, um, we, you know, we, we are completely, we have total freedom as to what tools we want, what framework yep. we use. And we're going to use the one that actually, you know, is, is quicker, more efficient, more performant, um, has a lower barrier of entry, but it, yeah, if you get confined into, you know, you have to use this to do that, then, then you have to sort of like, instead of asking why you just have to do it yeah. <laughs> and that Absolutely. can be frustrating. I, I can confirm that it's actually a lot better at the university now. Um, right. One of my uh, lecturers at the time, <clears throat> uh, he actually was one of the organizers of a user group that I was organizing. I ended up organizing as well. Mm -hmm. So we've kept in touch and I've given some guest lectures back oh, at the university. Cool. Yeah. Um, and they, they are teaching a lot more mo like modern PHP practices where they're telling, they're teaching people what composer is and how frameworks work. And they use like slim for the latest projects. Oh, they're that's working awesome. on. Yeah. It's really nice to see that they're actually teaching things that are going to be directly appropriate to what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And especially with asking sort of people from the PHP industry to go in and give talks and lectures to them. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you know, this is actually how it works in the real world. These people have been doing it for, you know, X number of years, like, you yeah. know, listen to them. They, they know what they're talking about. Yeah. So it's nice to see that there's been, a, there has been progress in that. That's really good to hear. It, yeah. it gives me sort of hope that they're actually going to come out with tangible skills that they can put to practice in. Well, yeah. In I mean, what, what, one. one thing I must remember is that, you know, when, when I went to uni, it was, it was, uh, you know, a decade plus ago. Uh, and it was like, that what they do then is certainly not what they're going to do now. But I just Absolutely. have that sort of isolated view of those small <laughs> little two two year yeah. or four years that I was there um, through through college and university and all that jazz. Um, one would hope that it's progressed. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, it does. That, that, that's the big part is that it didn't feel like it had progressed when I was there, but yeah. now it's, it seems like it does. Oh, that's so, really good. Uh, it's that, good to know. That's yeah. that's super cool. So, um, do you would you recommend? Uh, for people looking at university degrees to go for a degree that has this uh, sandwich inside, is that? I think it's incredibly valuable if you if you do want to go to university and that's mm. the path you've decided that is relevant for you. It's yeah. not for everyone. I know plenty of people that decided not to go to university, spent that four years that they would have spent in university working mm. Mm. Um, and you know have come out doing just as well as someone who's gone to university. Yeah. I think if you do go to university, there's a lot of a lot of the skills that I found for it weren't the technical skills. They were the, the life skills as you, you know, were because sure. you move away from home and you, yeah. you're out on your own a bit more. Yeah. But I think the sandwich degree is a really crucial part of it. Mm -hmm. I really think it was absolutely crucial to me getting that job after university and, and being able to progress in the way I did. I don't think I would have been able to do that had I not had that experience. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. That's I really, I really enjoyed it as well. Yeah. It was nice. Yeah. Well, that always helps. That always yeah. helps when you're enjoying what you're, what you're learning. Um, can you talk about how that progressed into 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 the next job? Um, you, you mentioned that you had a, a series of interviews. No, you 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 jumped into a job extremely quickly, didn't you? After yeah, after the degree, um, how, you know, how did that how did that feel? How did that how did that work? What was the uh, what was your your you, you had experience in the industry before, right? Yep. in that sandwich degree. So yeah. was that something that you were super looking forward to getting back into that or was there nerves or, you know, whatever? I, I was really looking forward to it again because I wanted to sort of be doing it, you know, in air quotes for real. I yeah. liked the idea of actually, you know, having an impact and, you know, putting stuff into production and, uh -huh. um, the jobs that I applied for, uh, I did apply for before I'd even started my exams. And then I had the exams over a sort of, I think it was about a month or so period. Right. Um, and the interviews I had lined up sort of in and amongst them. Yeah. Um, the job I ended up taking um, was on the day that I had a number of, I tried to sort of bulk block them up um, into sort of one block, uh, you know, went into the interview, um, came back out, sat down to have lunch before I went off to the next one and got a phone call from the, the recruiter that I'd used. I'd been speaking to at the time to help me get that one. I said, yeah, they'd like to offer you the job, but I've not even been out of the office for 20 minutes. No way. Um, 
and it was and when I, I then found out it was purely because i had that year experience they knew that i could hit the ground running mm-hmm. they knew that i wouldn't come in and have to learn it all again from scratch they knew mm-hmm. that i could you know academia wanted to teach you that it's all a perfect world and reality is not that way so we know that you know you mm. can you can get the stuff done um yeah, yeah and it was really exciting once i'd finished my exams i started the job uh, yeah i think it was the next week um sweet and sort of yeah again hit the ground running i was i was stuck in from day one um i you know pushed code to production within the first week and <laughs> it was just kind of onwards from there really because it because they were confident that i, I knew what i was doing that's uh, brilliant which was really nice yeah, yeah that's brilliant that's brilliant you hit the ground running awesome yeah, absolutely awesome can you can you talk about how that progressed um into into your speaking career how did that manifest yeah. So it was more sort of towards the end of that job, really. Um, I started getting involved with PHP's Midlands, which was the user group uh, based in Leicester. Mm-hmm. At the time, I was living in Derby, but I heard about a workshop that was being run um, on Symphony, and mm-hmm. the company that were running it were part of this, uh, one of the supporters and a part of this group, PHP's Midlands. So I was like, oh, I've not heard of that before. I'll go along and check it out. I uh, went with some friends, um, and we went to this workshop, really good workshop. Uh, and yeah, at this workshop, met one of my old lecturers who was an organizer of PHP Midlands and was like, you know, you should come along and great. I'll see what it's all about. So I started going to the user group. Um, it was incredible. It was, it was kind of, oh, I didn't even know there was this world out there. It mm. was a whole different side of the industry I hadn't seen before. And then got chatting to them and they'd said, you know, oh, there's this um, conference coming up in Manchester. We're all going to be going to PHP Northwest. Mm-hmm. Uh, you should really look at coming along. We think you'd have a great time and it'd be sort of an eye opening experience for you. So I was like, I'll, I'll check it out and book my ticket there. And that's when I then found out that the, uh, two of the organizers from PHP Midlands were running the unconference at, uh, PHP Northwest. Right. So the main conference was three tracks of organized talks and the unconference was a separate track where the attendees give the talks. Mm-hmm. So they vote on the topics and they work out what they want to speak about through the day. And then they, based on the votes, they schedule the talks. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of an off the cuff event where it's kind of the attendees decide on what's spoken about and give the talks as well. And one, you know, one of the organizers said, um, oh, you should give this, this talk on, I'd been working with a new web server that no one had really heard about before. Mm-hmm. They're like, you should talk about that. It'd be really cool to hear about what makes it different and interesting. Right. So I was like, okay, I can do that, I think. You know, starts shaking in my boots, terrified <laughs> of the thought of giving this talk. Um, so I wrote some slides up um, and I gave the talk at the unconference. I think there was maybe half a dozen people in the room. There was only about sort of six people or so. Okay. It was still terrifying. Yeah, yeah. Um, the main conference had one of the big speakers speaking at that point. So I thought, you know, that everyone was at that talk and I can understand why. Um, but it was, you know, my first speaking experience was, yeah, in this room of six or so people. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was utterly terrifying, but it, you know, the talk got well received. People learned something new and it was, it was re- actually afterwards I kind of sat down. I was like, that was, that was quite good fun. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was really nerve wracking and there was a lot of work to prepare these slides for a 20 minute talk, but mm. I really enjoyed that. And it was really nice. Um, and then, about a month or so later, uh, PHP Spindlers actually, actually organized an on-conference as a standalone event in Leicester okay. and had run it, we've, you know, we'd run it, I think, five years in a row after that. Yeah. Um, and I gave the talk again there, but, you know, much more people in the room there was, because it was an on-conference as an event in itself. And again, people were like, that was really cool. I really liked that talk. And mm. that was that was kind of it, really. I was sort of hooked. So I, nice. I decided that I think I could do this a little bit more and yeah. progress from there, really. You, you caught the bug. And, a little uh, bit, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Um before we go any further, can you just um define what an unconference is for those yes. that don't know? So an unconference <laughs> is uh a conference where you start, you go to the the event and there are no talks scheduled for the day. So okay. you turn up and there's a blank talk schedule. Um as an organizer, it's absolutely terrifying. <laughs> I bet. Um, <laughs> I organized it for, I think, four years, the PHP Spinners one. And I've you know spoken to other people and they ask, how do you get over the nerves of not having talks organized for an event where you've got, you know, X number of people turning up? And I was like, you, you don't get over the nerves. You use those nerves to kind of drive you. Mm. So there's there's no talk scheduled. Um, and then people turn up for the day and we, we detail all what of un- un- conferences before the event. So they're not just turning up for this event, not knowing what's going on. But effectively, everyone decides and votes on what they want to talk about. So we... We have a number of volunteers who go around asking everyone. They take a post-it note and a Sharpie and they ask everyone what topics they're interested in. You know, right. what's interesting you? What's, what's, what are you lo- looking at learning about? Oh, you want to learn about Docker? Cool. Well, we'll write that down. Uh-huh. So, they, you know, they write all the different topics on post-it notes and then they display them on a, a sheet of paper. And if anyone at the event thinks they can talk about that particular topic for 15 to 20 minutes, they'll write their name on it. And then people... That's then, you know, they're, they're them saying, I'm willing to give a talk about Docker or Go or... Um, 
you know the latest javascript framework mm. or um you know ci pipelines or something um and they then write their name on it and that gets moved to a separate board where people can vote on what they want to hear about so they put a little tick next to the talks they want to hear about and we then schedule those talks through the day but we don't ever schedule talks more than two sort of slots in advance mm -hmm. so the idea is that you don't ever really know what's happening in an hour's time <laughs> because it's not been decided upon yet um which makes it really good fun because it's always really dynamic and interesting mm. because things are always changing and it gets people out of the room to mingle amongst each other in the lobby and then go back into the rooms yeah. rather than just sort of looking at the schedule for the day and going, well, I'm going to sit in track <laughs> one and I'm not going to move. Yeah. Um, it really creates a nice environment of everyone mingling. Um, but again, as an organizer, it's utterly terrifying because you're there going, well, what if we run out of talks? There's, you know, there's nothing going to be nothing left. Thankfully, in all the years we did it, that never happened. Oh, that's good. I was just um, about to ask. But it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a really cool event from a, you never know what's going to happen. You know, you never know what people are going to talk about. We've had people that have been speaking for 15 years speak at these events. We've had people go there not intending to give a talk whatsoever. Nope, you're never going to get me up there. I'm never going to say anything. And then three hours later, they're standing there talking about, you know, what's new in Laravel or something. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. We've had people go there, give their first talk at the PHP Midlands Unconference and then take that talk to user groups all over the UK and give it at conferences and it's nice to see that because that's kind of how I got started. Yeah. And it's nice to be able to give other people that opportunity. That's been really cool to be able to do. So the, the when you go to these on-conferences, do, do you have an, a talk in mind for, as an attendee, uh, as something that you could possibly do? You're not, you're not making this up on the spot. No, I mean, um, some people have done. Um, I typically know that when we've put on one of these events, there's going to be a number of attendees there who've got a talk in mind. Maybe mm. it's an idea that they're working on. They're not fully prepared to give it as a 45 minute or hour long talk yet mm. but there's enough to be able to talk for 20 minutes or so and i know that there'll be you know half a dozen people there that have got that sort of talk ready right. so i can always rely on them to kind of kick things off um we have had some people and it's not always talks even um we have a number of what's called a park bench session right. where you have four chairs set up at the front of the stage and or the front of the room mm. and someone sits down and poses a question to the audience um so one of the ones we had was what do you think about bdd and what does BDD mean to you? And then if you want to contribute to the discussion, you go up and you sit at one of the chairs like you would on a park bench and you talk to the person next to you about the particular topic in their hand. And then if someone else wants to join the discussion, they go up and sit down on one of the chairs. And then if at any point you don't feel like you're contributing to the discussion, you get up and you go sit back in the audience. So the panel discussing things at the front of the room is constantly rotating. That's so that's cool. the thing that as long as you've got a topic that you generally think you might be interested in or want to hear about, you don't need to do any preparation for it, really. Yeah. We've also had roundtable discussions where someone sort of poses the question, what makes legacy code good? And right. the room will sit and discuss, why is it good? You know, what makes it good? Yeah. And it's a, it's just a more of a philosophical kind of, let's just have a chat about something rather than I'm going to talk to you and you sit there and listen. And those are often really valuable sessions because everyone brings a different perspective. Yeah. But we do have, we do have some people that have prepared slides and, you know, have practiced and they've, you know, they've got their 20 minutes down and that's great. Like we, we love that stuff. Mm. Mm. Um, but that's what makes an unconference really interesting because you, like you say, you don't really know what, what you're going to get through. Yeah. The day. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, that, that, that really is. I mean, I, I, I wasn't aware of these park bench, uh, panels almost that are dynamic. And I guess yeah. that's the important point, isn't it? It's the, the fact that it's dynamic, you know, there's, yeah. there's never really, uh, four of the same people talking yep. at, at, yeah, that's really, yeah, the, really cool. The person that sat down there at the start of the session is probably not going to be sat there at the end and it will be four completely different people that have, yeah. you know, just, just been sparked through the conversation that they're listening to. Well, it's you, really interesting. You, your, your, um, you're getting a different perspective all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I love that. I really do. Yeah. Okay. So how long have you been speaking for? Uh, so that first <laughs> talk at the unconference was in 2014. Right. So it'll be coming up on five years now. Um, yeah. I didn't, I've been giving a lot of bits and pieces of talks. Uh, I gave a couple of workshops at local user groups and mm. spoke at a couple of smaller groups. Um, it was really kind of 2016, 2017, 2018 that I kind of, mm picked up the speaking seriously right that was kind of when i decided that that was i could actually do this a little bit more right. and a large part of that was the company that i was working for at the time uh, i started working there in 2015 and the company that i was working for was a company called viva it right now they actually were the people that ran that symphony workshop that got me involved with php's midlands in the first place Sweet. and so you know they, they sort of because I knew that they were so involved with the community and they, they really see that as a part of, you know, who they are as a company. It's a big part of their identity. Mm -hmm. They really encouraged me to, to push this and you know, that like you can, we really want to see you mm. speaking because we mm. think you can do it. And a big part of that was to build up. I'd lost a lot of confidence previously. 
Right. And a big part of that was to help build that confidence back up just to kind of be more assertive and um, be able to feel like I was able to to speak with any kind of authority on something. Um, mm. And they kind of were really, really encouraging for that. So they, they fully supported me in, in giving those talks and submitting to conferences and, you know, allowed me the time to, to do that. And it was it was incredible. Yeah, that, that, that was that's a that's an interesting, interesting story. So you 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 did uh, speaking for a while and then it sort of dipped and then you you got onto it and you decided to do it more seriously. Um, yeah, it was it was it was kind of a I just felt like it was something that I really wanted to explore because uh, right. I enjoyed it so much and yeah. through you know you know one to one meetings with my boss and sort of the, my personal yeah. improvement plans and things we would identified that building back up that confidence and having that sort of public profile was something that could benefit me as yeah. a, an individual but they really liked it because it benefited them as a company as well um you know our brand was bright orange hoodies and the, the, the company was you know everything was bright orange you know we had a bright orange sofa in the office and a whole wall painted orange and that was right. our identity and we'd we, as as a company we would go to events together and people would see this group of half a dozen people in bright orange hoodies together having fun and enjoying ourselves and right. we've really had a, a really good sort of team camaraderie and team spirit yeah and you know to then have someone in an orange hoodie on stage was right. really cool because we you know we stand out a little bit and um, so they really liked the the idea that you know, this company is, they're, they're up on stage. They know what they're talking about. Um, so they mm. were sort of looking to push that from a, and, and being involved in the community, like I say, they, they were the ones that were giving up their free time and their company resources to help give this workshop to introduce people to Symphony and get people learning. Mm. And they mm. were a big supporter of PHP's Midlands and they've been a supporter both from a financial sub- sponsorship level through to, I organized the unconference. So they gave me the time to do that because they really at their core believe that, community is absolutely key to everything we do because if we mm. can make the programming community better it's going to benefit us and people want to come work for us because we're the ones that know what we're doing and we care and mm. and it did work and you know a lot of we didn't never used recruiters there and people that applied applied because they knew viva it because they worked in the community and they they were the people that were there at the events not just because they want to hire people but because they want to learn and they want to teach oh that's cool so they that was a big core part of them there. Yeah. And having me willing to do that in the community and go and give these workshops and talks and speak at user groups and conferences. They were really excited about that, which yeah. made me happy to do it as well, because I knew that I kind of had their blessing to, to, to go forth and sort of do this as a representative of the company. As well. well, that's that, that, that must have instilled a lot of confidence in yourself because you are, you're like the masthead in that sense. When you're doing a talk, you're not only representing yourself, but also the company that you're wearing the hoodie for. Um, yeah, it's yeah. it was a big it was it was a big confidence <laughs> boost. It was mm, um, mm. something that I at first was you know was a little bit like okay I need to get used to this, but um, you know I was giving sort of twenty talks a year one at one point wow. and it was uh, you know at various groups and conferences and it felt like you know every every other week I was at, a, at an event or something at some points. Um, but it, and I loved it. I, I wouldn't have changed it at all. I, I wouldn't. It was fantastic. But yeah, mm. like you say, it was building that confidence back up to then be like, yeah, I can do this. And, yeah. and they believe in me enough to give me the the freedom to trust me on stage yeah. as, as a representative of the company. It was, it was incredibly, incredibly valuable. Excellent. And I know that it's a very, it was a very rare position to find myself in. And right. Yeah. A lot of people don't have that. You know, if you, if you're going to give a talk at a conference, the company wants you to take time off and do it on your own dime kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's a terrible shame. I really think that companies can benefit an awful lot by giving their employees the chance to, mm-hmm grow in that regard i don't think it's a bad thing in any way shape or form to give your your employees to the, the time to do that mm. um mm. so it was I, I realized i was in a very lucky and privileged position to have that opportunity mm. uh, available to me really mm. that's uh that's a super interesting uh there you, you know you, you you've been given that opportunity um and it it, it helps i I, lo- I love the stories where you've got uh different cogs in the wheel and they're all spinning at the same time and they're benefiting yeah. each other. I like, I like that. Um, and, uh, hats off to that company who, who was giving you that opportunity. Um, so why, what is the thing that motivates you to speak now? Um, it, it kind of goes back to why, um, I joined Vivariti as well with the, the their sort of their care for the community. Mm. Um, as part of my job as the senior developer there, I was very heavily involved with mentoring the apprentices that came on board. Okay. So every year we had a new apprentice and I was um, very, very keen on teaching and mentoring them. Mm-hmm. And I, the kind of the events and the conferences and the speaking, I kind of see as a way to allow me to share my experiences and my ideas and, you know, help people learn from my mistakes <laughs> on a sort of a larger scale. Um, I really love 
teaching. I, it was one of those things that I, if I wasn't a programmer, I'd probably be a teacher. Right. I, I, in some technical capacity, I would, mm-hmm. I would, that would be quite cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's fundamentally, I like being able to sort of share experiences and mm-hmm. lessons I've learned with other people and sort mm-hmm. of teach them, you know, this is, this is how we did it. Not necessarily saying it's the right way or the best way. Mm-hmm. Here's what we did. Here's the lessons we learned, you know, go out and hopefully don't make the mistakes that we did kind of thing. So it's the, it's the, the sharing of knowledge. That's kind of the biggest part of what really interests me. Um, mm-hmm. I, I mentored at my job. I mentor in my spare time. It's kind of just teaching. It's that, it's that side of me that I, I, I like being able to, to do through conferences and events. I dig that. I dig that. So you're giving back to the community and you're helping. Yeah, I've been given a lot from the community and being able to kind of just do a little bit really helps. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so from, from, uh, uh, speaking from, um, from someone who is, who has never done it before. Right. So, so they're, they're kind of thinking, should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? Perhaps they've been uh, offered a position to do a talk. What are the the key pieces of advice that you can give to perhaps get over nerves, to sort of um, take your time over o- over it, and 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 do it to the best of that person's ability? Do you have any advice that you can give? Yeah, it's it's something that I'd still struggle with myself. Um, I don't think the nerves ever go away. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they will always be there. Um, I tend to find myself that within the first few minutes of getting on stage, you kind of get into the flow a little bit and they kind of dissipate and you can then sort of stand on stage and strut your stuff as it were. (laughs) Um, But I kind of practice is key to kind of everything. Mm. I think if you practice your, your timing and your breathing, it's, and it's easier said than done. Mm -hmm. Um, I talk very fast myself. It's something that I'm aware of, but completely forget when I'm on stage. So in my speaker notes, I always put every few slides, you know, in little square brackets, breathe. Um, <laughs> and what feels like an eternity to you is really only one or two seconds to the audience and they don't notice, but it feels like you're standing still for about 10 minutes up on stage sometimes. <laughs> um, so it really helps that sort of thing. But practicing uh, talking um, even to an empty room um it's the biggest thing because once you get that practice down and you know the flow of how your talk works, that's kind of the big part. So it doesn't feel like you're just reading from your slides or that you can kind of step away from the lectern a little bit and mm. present more openly and speak on sort of things with authority as it were. Mm. So being able to kind of, you don't have to memorize your notes. You don't want to sound like a script. It's kind of just, you know, bullet points to make sure you hit key areas. is always a, a, a good idea, but yeah, it's kind of practice, practice, practice. I, often set my laptop up on a second screen so I can see my speaker notes and not see the screen behind me. And I'll practice the talk as if I was giving it to a full room, but it's me in my office or my living room <laughs> and there's no one else there. Or, you know, my, uh, my elephants are all on the sofa in front of me <laughs> like an audience. Um, and I use them to practice and it's, you know, in you, after the talk, you can record yourself. You can write notes as to what things you didn't, things you didn't think went well, mm. what things you want to improve on, what areas you think could do with a bit more tweaking or the timing isn't quite right. Or actually this slide belongs over there. Mm. So once you get that down, you don't have to worry about acting like every slide is on stage. Every slide is a new surprise to you because mm. you don't want it to be a surprise. You want it to be mm-hmm. slick. Slip, and it's yeah. it's it's a very difficult thing to do and it's never perfect for anyone even experienced speakers mm. but i think the biggest thing is to get over the nerves is to just practice because then you're not having to worry about what might happen mm. because you know because you've gone through it a dozen times right yeah that's a yeah interesting advice there yeah um i guess practice 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 i mean everybody says that right practice yeah. is practice is the key uh, yeah. but uh, having I, I like that what you said about having the uh, the laptop open and then another screen um it's all those little li- little things that you could do to help yeah ha- ha- and and once you sort of get into the habit of 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 doing that and and not having that sort of like big screen behind you that you have to sort of, you, you shouldn't be really reading this off of the screen, right? So no, absolutely. yeah, it's those little tweaks, those little tweaks. Even down to, I will, I will use my presentation <laughs> clicker and I will make sure that my laptop is not too close to me so that I can't just you know, hit buttons myself. It's my clicker. Ah, um, I like that. You know, Cause then it's as much like yeah. a real event as it would be. It's just that the room is not a yeah. hundred people. It's yeah. some elephants on the sofa. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. I, I, and, and I suppose like, you know, that forces you to move away from the laptop, right? So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, another piece of advice I'd probably say as well is I was given this by another speaker and they mm-hmm. were, they, they said to me, find your nodder. Okay. And that is the person in the audience that when you're talking, you'll always find someone in the audience who's kind of look at you and sort of nodding along. Like, you know, they, they agree. That's really, that's a really good point. Yeah. Right. I, I agree with that. If nothing else, 
don't focus completely on them because you look like you're staring at them from you're the stage and they yeah. might get a little bit <laughs> weirded out. But that's your person that's there for reassurance that, you know, they're agreeing with you that you're, you're doing well. It's okay. Yeah. So as a speaker, if you can find that person, that's incredible. Like pretend like none of the audience exists if you need to. And you're, you know, you're speaking to this person and that's, mm. they're the one that's absorbing all this information. And similarly, if you're an attendee at a conference, nod because it helps, <laughs> uh, you know, or if you're another speaker, yeah. You know, sit sit in another speaker's talk and you know be that person because we all need it. So yeah. it's it's find that you know find your nodder as well. Oh, I, I love that. Conference find once your and, nodder. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> brilliant. Can you can you talk about the the, the, the process of um, coming up with a talk and sort of the, the the process of submitting a talk and that basically, but how do you do it from inception of idea to getting on the stage? What's the process involved there? Okay. It's for me, I, for personally, I always find that the, the talks I want to give are talks that I have sort of direct experience in. Mm. Um, they're talks that I've come from experiences that I've learned from. So I've got a talk on, for example, content security policies. It's titled content security policies. Let's break stuff. <laughs> and the idea being that at some point in a job, I broke production with a badly configured content security policy. So that talk is directly addressing what things do I wish I knew mm. before I'd implemented that. So I wouldn't break production. Okay. And that talk is, you know, 50% getting everyone up to speed on cross-site scripting and, and what can be done. And then 50%, let's actually break a site with a content security policy so that you can see what I went through when I was doing it. <laughs> and I always find that learning, doing it from your real world experiences really helps. Yeah. Um, the other talk I, I really like doing is my Dungeons, Dragons and Developers talk. Yeah. And that's a talk about the, the experiences in running and leading and being a part of a software team and how that relates to being both a player and dungeon master in Dungeons mm. and Dragons. And I had that talk brewing in my head for probably two and a half years before I actually gave it. It had been brewing for so long and I just couldn't quite work out the pieces. And that's a big part of it is mm. the idea could be sat there for a long time. So I just have a list of talks that I, you know, I, I've got that are ideas and eventually they might form into something, but here's, you know, a bunch of topics that I think I could maybe form an idea on in the future right yeah and that talk was very much a i had this idea kind of in the back of my head for a couple of years and i just didn't know how to make it work mm -hmm. and then one day i was sat down with someone and um a, a friend who plays dungeons and dragons actually and they just said why don't you run it like a game of dungeons and dragons and that was that clicked with me in my head and i was like that's brilliant yeah. So I started, I st the first, my, it's, this isn't going to work for every talk, but my first iteration of that talk was I wrote a script like I was going to be running a game of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> and then I worked out what areas within that talk could fit that's a, a technical aspect. Yeah. And I actually found that that's worked in a couple of other talks as well. And it's, I, I like talks where you kind of, you tell a story, you start with something, um, an introduction and you get everyone up to speed in the middle, you kind of get through the meat of it. And at the mm. end, you kind of give a lesson to take away. Right. And yeah. I often find that telling a story means I kind of think about what do I want to get to at the end? What's the ending or what's the takeaway I want to give everyone. And then I work backwards from there. Mm. So what's the kind of the message I want to get to, to everyone to take away from this talk and then work backwards from there. And that could be uh, bullet points, you know, down to uh, starting to put together slides. What mm. key messages do you want to, to bring in that talk you might have three or four like very important points that you want to hit on and where do you put those um that's kind of my process for sort of coming up with the ideas of talks it's more about what things have i been working on and what things have i been directly involved with do mm. i think could be interesting to others mm. so if you're working on a project and you try to deploy to production and you hit a really weird bug with a piece of software or your ci pipeline failed on a friday and you couldn't get the deployment out and everyone was going home for the weekend that's a really interesting to lesson to learn from and what mm. what were your takeaways from that and how can other people either avoid doing that or mm. make it so that you can roll back those changes and deal with the the problems that's kind of a big part i find that yeah the, the real fun lessons to learn are when things go wrong and it's yeah. a painful experience but as long as you learn those lessons that really helps mm -hmm. so those are often really good talks for me is when something's gone wrong and someone says here's what happened to us here's how we dealt with it because mm. it either reaffirms what you're already doing because you've done it the same way and you've gone through those lessons and you sit there going i know what they're talking about because we did that and that didn't work for us either yeah. Or you're sat there going, I haven't known how to deal with this. And they've just given me that little nugget of information that's that's given me that spark where I can go and do this. Now. Well, yeah. Before before this this podcast started, before we had play, we were talking about imposter syndrome and, and, and having the a bit having the the uh, ability to see a speaker talk about a problem that they encountered and the solution that they, you know, and, and, and all the trials and tribulations that had come from actually trying to debug that and fix it and the stresses and the strains. Yeah. That's actually really good for an attendee to listen to because, Absolutely. because the attendee's like, ah, it's not just me. 
Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. In my content security policy talk, I make a point of at the point where I admit that I broke production. I stand in the center of stage. I address the the audience like I'm confessing my sins, and I say, <laughs> "Hi, my name's Matt, and uh, I broke production with a bad content security policy." Yeah. Let's stop. Let's not do that. Let's and it's you know, that. it's it's. I'm fully open to admitting the mistakes that we've made because we all make mm. them. And like you say, it's a really reassuring thing when someone's mm. standing on stage who, mm. you know, is up there on stage looking oh this person knows what they're doing and then they say no we broke things and things went terribly um it didn't work and here's how we fixed it you kind of go oh it, yeah it's not just me it happens to everyone yeah so that's that's kind of i like ideas that come from that aspect when yeah. sort of coming up with ideas for talks yeah. um and sometimes uh sort of taking that to a fully fledged talk is i will submit an idea to a conference um mm-hmm. without really thinking much ahead exactly how the talk is going to be structured um you know, people. I'll often submit talks that I've given before to conferences as well, and then if they pick those, I've you know already prepared it. Mm-hmm. But if I've submitted, I've got an idea, and I submit it to a conference. Mm. If they say no, no big deal. Uh, you know, it, it's disappointing, and you know, you, you spend years getting rejected before you get accepted at conferences. Um, but you know, that's that's no skin off your back. But if they say yes, there's no better motivation to write a talk than knowing you've got a deadline coming up, and there's going to be people relying on you to give that talk. Yeah. Um, it's it's a big motivating factor, but if again, if it's a topic that you've encountered and you've experienced, mm-hmm. you've already halfway there. You know the, the you know you can recall what you did and mm-hmm. and go through the timeline of what happened and and pick the pieces of well, what what do I wish I knew before that thing went wrong? Right. You know, do I do I wish I knew that having a way to roll back my production deployment was a really good idea? Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, let's address that in the talk. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, once you've prepared the talk, it's you know it's the the call for papers are. They're really varied. So these, so sorry to interrupt. These are the CFPs, yep. right? These the are, CFPs, yeah. yeah. Typically, a conference will put out a call for papers, which is the conference opening up and saying, we're going to be holding a conference. We'd like people to submit their talk ideas to us, and then we will um, go through, review them, and pick what ones we want to have at the conference and go from there. Mm-hmm. And typically, you know, they might have – say they have 10 speaking slots for, mm-hmm. for argument's sake. They'll probably have 100 talks submitted. So if you don't get picked, it's percentage wise, you know, chances are there's more people that aren't picked than are picked. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just sort of the nature of it, really. But they will typically open up and they will have you submit your title and an abstract, uh, maybe a small bit of information as to why you think you're a good fit for giving this talk. Uh, any other resources you've got? So if it's a talk you've given before, do mm-hmm. you have any links to videos or feedback that you've been given? Um, have being given feedback on talks is a really important thing. And mm. a lot of people at events, sort of, you know, they keep droning on about leaving feedback for the speakers, but it really does help because that that's, that feedback then goes to future events and they can submit that talk to other events and say, look, people really like what I'm talking about here and it helps, you know, get them to the next event. Yeah. Um, and they might have you write, you know, your bio and submit a picture and you kind of, it's generally all through an online platform and you'll submit that to the conference. Okay. And then, a number of weeks, months later, they will go through the review process mm-hmm. and a good conference will send out emails both for acceptance and rejections. You'll get an email saying, you know, we're really sorry. We had, you know, 300 submissions this year and we've only got 30 speaking slots, but you know, unfortunately you weren't picked. Um, or you'll get an email that says, you know, congratulations, you've been selected. Uh, please confirm with us you want to give the talk. And we'll look at the next steps for addressing things like, say, travel or accommodation and mm. sort of, you know, the logistics of the talk. Mm. Um, those are the nice ones to receive. Um, but yeah, that's that's typically kind of they'll approach you. The good conferences will also send the rejections out to say, you know, look, we're really sorry. Because right. there's nothing – as a speaker, there's often a sort of a slight element of frustration when you find out you're not speaking at a conference because everyone else is posting on Twitter that they are speaking at the conference. <laughs> yeah, I can And you imagine. suddenly see on Twitter everyone saying, I'm speaking at this event. And you're like, well, I guess I'm not because they haven't contacted me oh, yet. So yeah. cool. Um, that's that's always a little bit frustrating when you see that on, on Twitter. Yeah, God, I can imagine. Um, yeah. So what, what topics do you focus on? Um, it's really varied, actually. I've, I've given talks from – so my first talk was a talk on uh, – it's called Hiawatha, the best web server you've never heard of. Okay. And again, it was a talk that, again, no one's ever heard of no. this web server. Um, but And it, it was almost like a blessing because it meant I could kind of say anything and no one would really like <laughs> it. Um, but you know, technical talks on how that worked and some of the things it did, as mm-hmm. well as um, testing talks. Uh, I've done some front end talks. I was doing a lot of front end work at an agency I worked at, so I gave talks on like front end building with Gulp and sort of you know uh, the, the front end build process with Gulp and SAS and that kind of things. Okay. Um, talks on BDD and testing, uh, security, uh, the sort of what people call the soft skills, but I prefer sort of complementary skills. 
Oh, uh, I like that term. Yeah. I, don't, I don't like the term soft skills. It kind of puts okay. a, they're, they're crucial skills to what you should be doing. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah. So, you know, the Dungeons, Dragons and Developers talk is in no way a technical talk. It's mainly about how to work in a team and have a focused environment where everyone can work together. Yeah. Um, so I kind of like any real sort of wide ranging set of topics. I, I more prefer the style of talk than the topic of the talk. I try to be a bit more entertaining in the talks yeah, that I deliver. Yeah, so I, wanted, because, to, yeah, I yeah. wanted to talk to you about that because uh, you have the hat around somewhere. I do. It's just here. Yeah. So for those who are listening on the podcast, uh, Matt has a wizard hat from uh, Dungeons and & Dragons, and he wore that in uh, in his talks um, about the Dungeons and Dragons, the talk that you were just mentioning, um, you, the way you come across when you talk, you are, uh, it's a, it's a showman. It's a, it's an entertainer. You, you, you. you break down a technical, uh, and non-technical subject in a manner that can be, um, absorbed very nice, nicely, um, to, from the audience in an entertaining manner. And they come away feeling not only entertained, but they've also learned a, a, an awful lot of stuff. How did you find that? How, how did, were you always having, did you always have that mindset of, of I'm here to not only teach, but also to entertain? How did that, how did that work? Uh, firstly, thank you very much for those kind comments. Um, that talk specifically, I, <laughs> I'm a huge introvert. Right. It's, getting up on stage and speaking is one of those things that takes an awful lot of energy for me. Right. Um, but I've the Dungeons and Dragons one specifically. I'm I've played Dungeons and Dragons for a number of years. I've been a dungeon master, and I really enjoyed that aspect of it. And I just thought that with that particular talk, if I do it just as a tech talk and just happen to deliver it in a way that seems a bit more nerdy in the Dungeons and Dragons aspect, it wouldn't get the message across in the way that I wanted to do it. Mm. So I was like, I need I need to do something different. I need this to be fun. So I was like, okay, I'll write it like a Dungeons and Dragons game you know we're, we're running this adventure together we're mm. a party of people and we're going on this adventure and i'm going to stand on stage and wear a wizard hat because if i can do that then people realize that this can be fun and it's not just a guy on stage telling you how to work together in a software team mm. um but th I, that comes from the, the talks that i've really really enjoyed have been entertaining they've I've seen some incredible technical talks that have been very low level sort of technical details and they've been very educational and very good. Mm. But a lot of the time you kind of come away from them and you've, you've got a little bit of information, but the next day it's kind of gone a lot of the time because there's just so much technical information you haven't been able to absorb it. Sure. And the talks of where I've absorbed things have been where the speakers made me laugh and made me realize that this is ridiculous and yeah, let's do it anyway. Um, mm. And those are the talks that I've really enjoyed. So it was I just kind of thought I've got to I've got to go with it. I mean, um, Tech Nottingham was the I think it was the first time I gave my Dungeons Dragons and Developers talk, um, and I just decided, you know what? I've never done this talk before. I've got a room of, of probably a hundred plus people. I've got a wizard hat on. You know what? Let's just go for it. Let yeah. Let's just see what happens because at the end of the day, they, they, they've asked me to be here. I, I'm fairly certain people are going to appreciate this. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of go with it. And mm. and the feedback I got from it was that, yeah, it was, it was incredibly valuable from the lessons learned, but also that people really enjoyed it. And that was what stayed with them was the memorable side of it. And, mm. you know, when they think about the, oh, you know, that person really did get lost in that discussion and we didn't check in with them. Yeah. That's when the rogue wandered off into the woods and, you know, got eaten by a dragon. That was, you know, uh. that's, that, that, and it, it, you know, it's, it's ways to relate back to it. So that's, that's what really, really interested me. And it's, I kind of tried to do a talk that I would want to see. Right. Yes. And that, that helped a lot. Um, yes. Yeah. So that, yeah. that one was a, it's been a tricky talk because it's, it is two very, you know, nerdy topics. Um, I, that's why I try to make it accessible to people who don't play Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. I kind of, you know, bring in some stuff at the start to introduce it and get everyone up to speed where I'm not going to go super into detail and I'm not going <laughs> to, you know, explain the difference between wizards and sorcerers. That's irrelevant. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's just more about the, the, the general idea that, you know, you're a group of pa a party of people, be it a team or a party of adventurers. Um, you've got an environment that you work in, be that mm. an office or a dungeon and you have problems to solve, be mm. that, the next feature that you're trying to push out for your piece of software mm. or the dragon that needs slaying to save the castle. That's brilliant. You made yeah. that, you made that incredibly relatable. And I think that that's part of the key there is that you, you made, you, you created an association between something that, you know, when someone says Dungeons and Dragons, people know kind of what that is. Even if they haven't played it before, they, they yeah. kind of know it's a group of people talking about a quest 
right? Yeah. So you've Im- immediately set the scene um, and you've made that extremely relatable and people can associate and make uh, connections between various different things. And I think that was a fantastic way of going about it. I think that was a, a brilliant it, because it, because it wasn't dry. It wasn't sort of like, and now we're going to be learning about blah, blah, blah. It's sort of <laughs> like, you know, this, this dude is on a quest and he's, you know, he's hit this problem and you can sort of relate back to a, a, a thing in your daily development. And that, that was a, that was an important part of that talk yeah. specifically was I need, I, I, sort of every time I realized, okay, this is a point I want to make. Mm. What have I done in the past that's had that particular problem? Yeah. And it was, and that's why it had been formulated for so years. Cause I was like, in my brain, my, my brain was sort of telling me there's a connection here. There's something here, you know, you, you, there's a team here and a team mm. here. They're just doing slightly different things, but they're all working toward, you know, there's something there and I hadn't been able to work out how to connect it. Mm. And then I kind of looked at the adventure points of if this were a Dungeons and Dragons game, you know, how do you cross the river? Well, you've got multiple options. Well, that's just like when you come to build a feature, you've got multiple ways of doing it. There's no right way or wrong way. It depends on, you know, what resources you've got and how much time you have and, mm the skill set of your team and you know just because you choose to fly over rather than build a bridge that doesn't make you wrong it's just a different approach mm-hmm. and that was kind of when i found that relatable side and you mm-hmm. realize that everyone regardless of what project they've worked on has been in these same situations mm-hmm. giving them that real world aspect mm-hmm. to be able to be like ah oh, that's happened to me that's that's yeah. yeah that was what made that talk relatable even though the, the subject matter might not be something you potentially know about yes yeah definitely i definitely agree with that um, is that is that one of your favourite talks? That probably is my favourite talk. Right. Yeah, purely yeah. because it's 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 like, it's a bit of fun. Um, <coughs> mm-hmm. I can't take myself too seriously while giving it. I don't expect anyone <laughs> to take me too seriously giving it. I mean, I'm standing on stage wearing a wizard hat, um, but I hope that the lessons that learned from it are valuable. Um, mm. And it's mm. one of those. Yeah, it's. I, I want to. I want to have fun with the talks because. Uh, I want people to have fun listening to them. If I'm going to take an hour of someone's time, I don't mm-hmm. want them to feel like they've wasted that time. I want that, them to feel like they've got something from it. Mm-hmm. And if nothing else, if they've had a chuckle and they've had a laugh, then that's something at least. Yeah. And, you know, at the very worst, they might have had a giggle. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, wh- where Whereabouts are you going to be speaking next? Uh, so my next talk is at a conference called Go To. It's right. in Berlin in October. And then I fly back from there on a Friday and the very next day on the Saturday, I'm speaking at uh, Developers, Developers, Developers in uh, Nottingham as the Developers, Developers, Developers East Midlands Conference. Nice. Oh, wow. Um, And what what, what talks are you you doing on there? So those are both actually the same talk, um, but it's a new talk that I'm in the process of writing called Think Like a Hacker. And it's sort of a look into how a hacking mindset, sort of, you know, like the who, the what, the why, Mm. Mm. the where, the how, how that can help protect our systems if we kind of start thinking like an attacker, how we can take steps to actually protect against what they might want to do to us to to get the data that we've got, for example. Oh, that's cool. Ah, Yeah. yeah. So again, I, I want to make that talk fun yeah. because a lot of talks can be really dry. So I'm looking at ways to make that interesting, mm-hmm. you know, say playing to that s- stereotypical hacker mindset. Mm. Um, I've already got an idea for a little video that I want to film for it. And it's going to require like me, my girlfriend, a number of my friends to film. Yeah. Um, it's going to be like really cheesy. Um, think, you know, like the the hacking in movies where a hand's typing at a keyboard and then like you, just, you know, more hands start appearing and uh. the lights are flashing and, you know, those sorts of things. It's, I really want to just want to take a complete tongue in cheek look at it because, yeah. you know, if you just start getting down to the nitty gritty of stuff, it, it can be really boring. So again, I just want to have make it fun so that it's not just, yeah. you know here's the security here's a firewall setting for this particular application because that's not what i do and not what i'm interested in i'm more interested in about you know how can i as a programmer make sure Mm. that it's more difficult for someone to get the data that i'm working with Mm. you made a really good point there about making it fun um because these topics are serious topics right we get paid a lot of money to to work in this industry and it can be uh, i would imagine very easy to do a very serious talk in a very formal manner, a, bit, a little bit almost like your university lecturers, right? Yeah. Um, but you flipped it on the head and you, you've, you're making it fun. You're making it relatable and enjoyable. And I think that's where you've got the magic. Um, I, I, I really do. I'm going to ask you now a question that I would like to ask um, uh, future guests as well. You're, you are a bit of a guinea pig on this. Sure. Um, so I do apologize, but, uh, <laughs> if you have a, if you, if you were able to have a conversation with your former self, 
Um, what advice would you give? Um, it could be more than one if you wanted. Okay. Um, we sort of briefly mentioned before the show when I was talking about um, the unconferences. Um, mm. It's a very similar to a question that um, the uh, an old apprentice of mine, uh, an ex-apprentice as it were, a previous job, asked themselves. Um, they'd started with us at the company and they decided to give it a talk at an unconference and wrote themselves a letter. And the talk was titled, Dear Me, Things I Wish I Knew 12 Months Ago. Yeah. And it was it was an incredible talk, and they absolutely astounded the room. And they were so smart and wise with the things that they went through. Um, and then they, you know, they turned it around and asked this room full of incredibly experienced people, "What would you tell me twelve months ago?" And you know, twelve months ago, this person hadn't programmed, a, you know, hadn't been a programmer, and it was <laughs> so incredibly creative of them to yeah, do that. Yeah. So I really like this question because it, it just reminded me of that, <laughs> and it was a really nice nice moment. So um, personally, I think. The biggest thing that's been a benefit to me from a technical level would be like looking at multiple languages. Don't right. just focus on one language. Mm-hmm. I think um, I primarily work with PHP. That's kind of 95% of what I do at the minute. But knowing Ruby and Python and Go and JavaScript, that they're all kind of – or any number of other languages mm-hmm. – there's ideas and sort of techniques and idioms that they put in place that you kind of think, oh, that's a really nice way of doing that. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense in that ca- in that capacity. Or actually, no, I, I think that this way does it better, for example. You know, it's, oh, I really appreciate this particular piece of tooling because this other system doesn't have it and I really feel like I, I'm lost without it or something. Mm-hmm. I think that's, from a technical level, that's the biggest piece of advice I would probably give myself is, yeah, go and look at as many languages as you can. You don't have to be an expert in all of them, but knowing a little bit is really useful because it just gives you that that ability to kind of be like, I've heard of that. I can go mm. and look into that and dig deeper if you need to. Yeah. From a, a non-technical aspect, I'd probably say go to a user group because I didn't for so many years. Um, I'm fairly certain PHP's Midlands was running whilst I was at university. So it's, it's being run in Leicester and I'm at university in Leicester and I had no idea it was there. Whether that's because I just don't remember being told about it or mm. I just hadn't been told about it, I mm-hmm. can't remember. But yeah, that was the biggest thing that kind of changed my outlook on programming was realizing there's this community of programmers out there that mm. are there to help each other. They're not there to compete or they're not, you know, shouting at each other because you work at competing companies or whatever. No, they're, they're there to to make everyone better and 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 really share in that kind of shared experience. Even if it's just, you know, you go to the event and then afterwards you sat down having a drink with someone and you're lamenting over the latest problem you've hit or, you know, the nightmare client that you're dealing with. It's <laughs> just a sort of a shared mindset of like, you know, and all these like-minded people, it's, mm. it's a really valuable thing. I really um, dig I defi- that. I definitely tell myself that. Yeah. Yeah. I really dig that. I, I, I really also like the, f- the first one you gave about the um, learning multiple languages because you 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 gain a, a a well-rounded view of what the language that you are working on can and cannot do, yep. um, because if you're trying to solve perhaps the same problem in different languages, then you're going to be doing it in different things. You're going to be different using different libraries, different solutions, um, and you can become very blinkered. You know, I'm just a PHP dev, and that's all I care about. Um, Absolutely. But but w- really, something that that I was personally open my eyes was um when when I moved from the academic world into the into the real world um uh was the fact that it's not just writing PHP. You've got to deal with deployment, you've got to deal with um cron jobs, you've got to deal with all sorts you've got to deal with the database, you yeah. know, all of those kind of things. And it's not just you just you're not always using one single language. Um and uh yeah you 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 just learn the the idioms of what PHP or Python, whatever it is that your core thing uh, can do. Um, so yeah, I to- totally agree with that. Totally agree with that. And I love that story about the letter. Um, you know, the, the, the guy who who um, r- wrote the letter to himself and talked about yeah. all the things that he he would have uh, mentioned to himself. That was, that's such an awesome idea for a talk. It, it really was. It completely blew me away. And- yeah. It was he, he was he's an incredible developer um, as well, and it was yeah just to see that kind of level of wisdom from him was just yeah. it was re- it was really cool, um, yeah. and he absolutely knocked it out of the park. That, like yeah, um, yeah, I was I was I was like yeah that that's damn that's a really good idea <laughs> like that that could be a full you could go and give that at a conference. I'm fairly certain it would be a very popular talk. Like it was it was incredible. And yeah. you you said that he did that when he was young. Yeah, he started with us. Um, I believe when he was maybe 16 or 17. No way. Um, and he, yeah, uh, he sort of started programming a few months prior and then joined us for an apprenticeship. 
um, and did that not long afterwards. And yeah, it was, that's why it was incredibly valuable. You know, he's, mm. he's very new to the industry, but mm. then he's got a room full of very experienced people. You know, some people have been doing it for three years. Some people have been doing it for 30 and they're mm. sat there. Um, and he turns around and says to them, right, what would you tell me 12 months ago? That's cool. And I was just like, oh, that's incredible. That's really smart. Yeah. I you know, love you've that. got a wealth of knowledge and experience in front of you. And you've just tapped into that with a single question. And then the entire room got discussing and kind of the things that they wish they'd told themselves. And he was kind of picking up on that. It was, it was, in, it was one of my favorite talks I've ever seen of yeah. any conference. That's incredibly yeah. engaging. Yeah, yeah, it really was. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Matt, it was, uh, it was awesome speaking to you. I really appreciate your time. Is there anything else that you would like to, to mention anything we haven't touched on? Uh, no, it's been, it's been great chatting to you. It's been, um, it's been really nice to, uh, to just kind of be able to share that, that sort of side of, yeah. of uh, programming. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. I, I, I no, thank you. you. It's been good. You've, um, you've obviously got a wealth of knowledge, um, with speaking and, uh, I wish you all, all well. So, um, I, and do check out the, the, the talks I'll put, I'll try and find the links to those future talks that you're doing and I'll try and put yep. them in the, in the show notes. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I can send you links when I, uh, when sure. I get them. What's your, what's your, what's your Twitter handles and all that jazz? Uh, I'm at Bronte on Twitter, uh, Bronte on GitHub as well. If you want to check out any code stuff there, cool. um, if anyone wants to, they're free to tweet me, DM me, my DMs are open. If anyone wants to chat about anything, um, I've got a website, mfyu.co.uk. If anyone does want to check it out there, I, if I decide a blog post is needed, I put it on there, but it's not regularly updated. <laughs> um, it's just kind of a place to, to put ideas because I really hate Twitter threads. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Well, thank you ever so much again for coming on. I do appreciate thank you for it. Me. No worries. No worries. And thank you ever so much, everyone, for watching on the YouTubes and listening on the podcasts. Thanks very much. Happy coding, everyone. I'll see you again soon. Cheers. Bye.